Well, good morning. It's an honor to be here today among so many uh, maritime professionals gathered here. And while I'd like to thank the hosts and uh, conference organizers for putting together uh, this excellent program, I also want to thank, uh, in particular, the chiefs of navies uh, that are here uh, and for uh, them uh, uh, working with me over my tenure as the commander of the, of the Pacific Fleet. Uh, can't say enough about that. This program offers a unique opportunity to meet as maritime and naval leaders, operators, practitioners, colleagues, all of who understand the need to work together on important issues related to our maritime security and stability. But before I get too far along here, I'd like to thank uh, Admiral Ray Griggs and his team for just such a splendid International Fleet Review and all the navies that participated in that review. Well done to all. I'm here today to speak to you about the roles of our navies that play in supporting maritime security in this region and throughout the world. It's a role that is critical to our nations individually and collectively. This morning, I'll cover the following points. First, the importance of our collective maritime security in this Indo-Asia Pacific region. Also, how we have been addressing the challenges we face in this vibrant world we live in. Third, the opportunities we have to improve as we continue to work together in the future. And finally, I will address our U.S. rebalance strategy. Looks like I'm successful here in operating this technical device. Today, as we live in a globalized world where our economies are more and more interconnected and interdependent, while many nations represented here rely on the freedom of the seas to obtain the resources from their economic exclusion zones, all nations are relying on the sea for the transportation of energy, goods, and commodities. Shipping on the open seas carries the bulk of all trade between nations, and we can ill afford any disruption to their movement. Freedom of the seas has been key to the economic prosperity we have all shared since the conclusion of World War II and is key to our continued success in the future. Our navies play a significant role in ensuring the freedom of the seas by maintaining security and stability in the maritime domain. As you know, more than 90% of trade and half of the oil used in the Indo-Asia Pacific region moves by sea. This slide also shows the tremendous volume of trade that flows along key sea lanes. The yellow lines here represent the routes where greater than 5,000 container ships transit each year. In recent times, we have seen the flow of up to 5.3 trillion in global trade through the South China Sea annually. We've also seen as much as 1.3 trillion in U.S. trade flow annually through the Straits of Malacca. So clearly, the United States has an interest in this area, just as every nation in attendance here today. That's why it's so important that the navies in this region continue to work together towards the important goal of maintaining that security at sea for prosperity ashore. However, we do live in an uncertain world where stability and security in the maritime domain can be threatened by man-made crisis or natural disasters. Today, the lives and livelihoods of so many can be threatened, sometimes in an instant. We have to deal with tensions related to resources and territorial claims. The unpredictable behavior of belligerent or irrational nation states, competition between developing nations vying to assert their influence, and a range 
of non-state actors and transnational threats. Those are man-made problems we face. Consider what nature can do to affect the flow of trade in regions with typhoons, such as the ones we're dealing with today, earthquakes, volcanoes, and of course, tsunamis. To effectively address these security challenges, it requires our collaboration, cooperation, and strengthening of mutual trust, friendships, alliances, and partnerships. We work it every day. Just consider all that we do in the region together. Our navies and coast guards have been working together to ensure stability and security, enabling an opportunity for continued economic prosperity. This, of course, involves sailor-to-sailor -sailor interactions at all levels as we work to ensure stability by conducting humanitarian assistance to disaster relief, maritime security, deterrence, and, of course, if deterrence fails, power projection. During my tenure as the commander of the Pacific Fleet, I've just been thoroughly impressed with the tremendous capabilities of your navies and the professionalism of your sailors. But I know we can all appreciate that sometimes the potential challenges we face in this region can surpass the ability of any one nation to address them alone. That's why it's so important to have interoperable capability with our allies, our partners, and our friends so that we are able to prepare for crisis and if required, we can respond accordingly. Today, the United States Navy conducts exercises and training events with over 20 allies, partners, and friends in this region to increase partnership cap capabilities to address uncertainty in the region. This is something we clearly put a high value on and I look forward to continuing that in the future. But the question at the bottom of this slide is a valid one. Can we take it up a notch? Can we do more together to ensure the future security in the maritime domain? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing the right things right? It's important to ensure credible interoperability between our navies. Of course, interoperability here means more than a commonality between our technology. It also involves a deeper understanding and acceptance of our many different and unique cultures, our operational doctrine, and our individual nation's political sensitivities, just to list a few. To improve in these areas, it requires us to continue to work together, and even now, we are planning for the future. As an example, I'm delighted to see that so many have been willing to participate in the Rim of the Pacific RIMPAC exercise series. Last year was the largest in the RIMPAC history, with over 22 nations participating. We expect RIMPAC 2014 to be another history-making exercise. By demonstrating our ability to unite as a fully interoperable coalition of navies, we can more effectively ensure security and stability that is so important to all of us here. That takes commitment on the part of everyone who has stake in the security in this region. As you know, this is particularly this slide is particularly telling to me. Four days ago, I was in Hawaii. Then I flew to Japan. Then I flew here. I was looking down at a lot of ocean throughout those flights. So if this picture in the middle doesn't fully convey to you just how big the Pacific is, it's one half of the planet. And my stiff body will reaffirm it's big. At 500 knots, it took about 10 and a half hours to get to Japan. So as you can imagine, traveling by ship at 15 to 20 knots takes even longer, it takes about 10 days. That's why it's so important for our Navy ships to be deployed forward to those areas of consequence 
throughout the region. It's also important for your ships to be out and about in the region where their presence can act as a deterrent to criminal activity and mischief, and they can minimize their response time to crises as well. Of course, it is important to have the right presence for the right reasons. Though we all have many interests related to this important region, we must also remain mindful that security and stability is the cornerstone to shared prosperity and peace. From maritime security to cyber security, from the high seas to the EEZs, the United States is committed to fostering a rules-based regime of relationships that respect international law and international norms. This includes a healthy respect for adherence to international law, including important mandates of customary international law, such as the freedom of navigation, access, and use of the seas as evidenced by the UN Convention of the Law of the Seas. The United States remains fully committed to peacefully resolving regional disputes with respect to territory and the maritime regimes that are always derived from land territory. We remain committed to the goal of achieving a code of conduct with respect to these issues. It is the responsibility of our nations to demonstrate and reinforce our united commitment to establish international norms. While our forces can surge to respond to any crisis, it takes trust and cooperation for us to effectively confront crises together. Of course, you can't surge trust and cooperation. It takes time and effort to build it. As an example, consider the effects of trust and cooperation between the United States and Japan when the United States surged forces to help in the wake of that unprecedented earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis of 2011. Our two nations have been working together to build that level of trust and cooperation for over 60 years. Of course, we've been working just as long with many of our allies and partners in the region and have built that same level of trust and cooperation with them. But there is more that can be done by reaching out to other nations and engaging them as well. The Pacific Partnership Operation is a great example of the type of mission that helps partner and host nations start to build trust and cooperation. In 2012, they had the model, prepare and calm, to respond in crises. Working together with our allies and our partners and friends and non-governmental organizations in Pacific Partnership does just that. Here's another example of a multilateral success. Over the past decade, we've been we have seen significant decreases in the incidents in the Straits of Malacca where the Malacca Strait Patrols have combined their efforts with Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand to prove that by working together, we can address any challenge. I am hopeful that we can translate these successes into combined efforts in other areas of concern. Today, we are looking to find more opportunities to work together multilateral engagements so that we can further increase trust and cooperation in the region. As an example, our CARAT exercises, that's cooperation of float readiness and training, have traditionally been bilateral. But today, we're putting emphasis on our desire to improve in these exercises and make them more multilateral where it makes sense. During the last seven decades, since the end of World War II, the nations of this region have shown their resilience by not only rebuilding, but thriving. Just look at the changes to several key cities in the Indo-Asia Pacific over the last 70 years as they have grown and prospered. This works. 
There we go. This is a trend that we hope to continue to see far, far into the future. The U.S. rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific region reflects our understanding of just how important this vibrant region is now and will be in the future. The U.S. is resilient too, but in a slightly different way than I just described. Despite the political and financial uncertainty that we are facing today, we will maintain our presence in the Indo-Asia Pacific region and we will continue to rebalance to this important region. Over the last week, our U.S. Secretary of Defense, Hegel, and our U.S. Secretary of State, Kerry, have been traveling throughout the Asia Pacific region, reaffirming our nation's our nation's commitment to the rebalance. At the bottom of this slide is a recent comment made by uh, my, my Secretary of Defense. I think it speaks volumes. Quote, the Asian rebalance is a priority. You always adjust your resources to match your priorities, quote. Since the end of World War II, our nation has maintained a continuous presence in the Indo-Asia Pacific region as we worked to maintain security and stability in the maritime domain. Despite the cyclic nature of defense spending, our Navy has always maintained a robust and capable presence in the region. This time, in my opinion, it will be no different. We will remain postured forward, we will remain ready, and we will be rebalancing to this region. As I conclude, I'd like to talk a little bit more on rebalance. Of course, I'm excited about new platforms, modernization, equipment, and technology that continue to flow into this region, like the littoral combat ship, the P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol reconnaissance aircraft, Virginia-class submarines, the new MH-60 Romeo and Sierra helicopters, just to name a few. I am, however, even more excited, though, about the intellectual focus of the rebalance. The whole of our U.S. government is rebalancing intellectual capacity and capability and leadership attention toward the region, and the United States Navy is doing the same. We're prioritizing doctrine in our concept of operations development and increasing our experimentation and the validation of new tactics, techniques, and procedures and operational concepts. We're developing our people to serve in and better understand the Indo-Asia Pacific region to include revitalizing the Foreign Area Officer program as just one example. Having talented people that know the region, building strong relationships is key to our success. We're also engaging in increasing powerful ways with you, our allies, partners, and friends to match our priorities with, of course, yours. For above all, I believe our interests are intertwined and that it is our interest to continue to work together for a secure and prosperous future. I thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today and, of course, look forward to your questions. Thank you.